Good evening. You're watching the Digital Age, and I am James Goodale. Is the financial crisis a digital meltdown? Is it enhanced by the fact that we have markets connected across borders, across countries by digital connection? Are the securities that people are trading so complicated because they've been created by computers that no one can understand them? Or is the financial crisis merely caused by greed and easy credit? Here tonight to decide that, discuss that question with us is John Cassidy, uh, a famed writer, I would say, for the New Yorker, New York Review of Books. Uh, you have a uh, column online with portfolio. with portfolio, and you wrote a book, which is relevant, I think, actually, when I think about it, dot con, C-O-N, but we're not talking about that tonight. We want to talk about the issues that I laid up in front, right. and I want to put up on the screen, John, a uh, quote from David Brooks' column uh, recently. Right. We're living in an age when a vast excess of capital sloshes around the world, fueling cycles of bubble and burst. When the capital floods into a sector or economy, it washes away sober business practices and habits of discipline and self-denial. Now what Brooks is saying here, uh, he's really raising uh, the, the two issues that I've uh, wanted to raise because he says at the first, we're living in an age. Well, that's the digital age. Right. And then, uh, and then he talks about uh, greed and uh, easy credit. Uh, so I'd like to start off with the first part of what I would call uh, the digital uh, connection to all of this. In some sense, do you think that the financial crisis is a product of our times? That's to say, right. a financial system that is. Uh, for all practical purposes, run by uh, digits, isn't it? Uh, when you think about it, no, of course I mean, you got people and greed, but I mean it, it's put together that way. No, it's a very good point. I mean, one of the reasons the crisis is global is because the markets are so interconnected. I mean, there's so many aspects of this. One is the globalization, but even just going back to the very basic sort of underlying thing which went wrong in subprime mortgages and subprime derivatives which you know, are very complicated. The only reason those things can even be traded is because there are now computer algorithms which figure out their prices, which everybody around the world can see. 20 or 30 years ago, and we just didn't have the technology to sort of drive that or to support a market like that. So uh, certainly, you're exactly right. It is a product of the digital age. Obviously, a lot of the factors, as you said, are ancient factors like greed and irrationality and herd behavior. But in this instance, they interacted with you know, the new technology we've got, and that's one of the reasons the crash has been so severe, I think. Uh, one uh, facet of all of this interests me, particularly, uh, which has an international uh, aspect to it, and that is AIG right. went down. We all know it went down. And it went down in some part uh, because of derivatives right. that were, and here's the international aspect, right. run out of a Lond run out of a London office. Right. Now, if you go back and uh, read some of the uh, books about Solomon Brothers, for example, right. uh, in the 1980s, there's a phrase in there that says, "Those guys in London are cranking this stuff out, and we didn't know what it was." And you, one has a suspicion. Uh, if that didn't happen again with AIG. I think it, certainly in the case of AIG it did. I mean there's just as much financial expertise these days in London as there is in New York. In some areas more so. I mean there are you know parts the certain derivatives markets and certain futures markets where London is the cutting edge and New York basically follows them. In AIG's case they basically obviously everybody knows they're a big insurance company just in doing regular insurance you know catastrophe life insurance car insurance but the, that, that's not what got them into trouble. What got them into trouble was their central treasury division which was basically an internal investment bank which was run out of London and they were selling a lot of exotic insurance products known as credit default swap now, did anybody in New York really understand what they were doing? I, pr I pretty much doubt it. You know, I mean, Do you really? Yeah, I think they, they had a general idea, but they certainly didn't take on the risks that were involved in it. You know what's interesting? One of the interesting uh, events, of course, of our time right now is we have a 
political election that has a generational divide in it. Right. And Obama is sort of the uh, new digital generation. Right. And uh, some people have trouble understanding that generation. Do you think there's a generational divide when you have uh, at AIG in this crisis where you have these young people, PhDs, right. trading this stuff? And uh, the older guys may not have PhDs right. or may not be on the net all the time or whatever. And that's another sure. aspect. Definitely. I mean, it's not just AIG. I mean, I wrote a big piece last year about uh, Stan O'Neill at Merrill Lynch. Now, Stan's a very bright guy, but I don't think he would claim to have sort of the in-depth mathematical understanding of a lot of the products which ended up bringing, bringing down Merrill Lynch. When you run one of these big investment banks, and as I say, AIG was effectively an investment bank in part, you really do have to trust the guys, the traders and the people who are supervising the traders, that their knowledge of the technology and of the underlying mathematics and the underlying risks that have been taken you know, are good. In a lot of cases, they weren't. You know, they were telling the boss, we're making X, X million dollars a year, going up 20, 30 percent every year. In return, the banks were allocating more capital to them so they could make bigger bets and take on more risk. And, you know, it looked for four or five years, it looked like these guys were geniuses. The banks were making more money than ever before. But it turns out they weren't really making money risk-free, which is what they were telling their bosses. They were taking on enormous risks and enormous leverage, enormous borrowings. But yeah, you're right. I mean, it's partly generational, but it's also just technical. There's a technical divide as well. A lot of the people. That's what I meant. It was, yeah, it was, it was a lot a of technical people divide are, because it was people are just not trained. The younger generation is technical. The older well, generation. Some, yeah, that's probably uh, true. Older generation is. That's probably true. But even the guys who you know have got PhDs from MIT and Chicago, they were the guys who were making the mistakes. You know, it's not that the mathematicians knew this all along. It was their models which fi which blew up. So it's not just a, the, the, the guys who didn't have the PhD didn't, didn't understand what they were doing, so they, they didn't have the capability to step in and say, you know, this underlying assumption's wrong, you're taking on too much risk. So, but you can't, I, I wouldn't say it's, you know, the, the stupid guys on top didn't understand it and the clever guys underneath did. It was the clever guys underneath who were making the mistakes. <laughs> um, what strikes me a little bit when you, when you discuss, discuss the guys on top and uh, the, the PhDs on the bottom, for example, right. Uh, whether that type of structure, which is a vertical structure, makes any sense in the digital age. One of the principal characteristics of the digital age, which you see all through today's life, terrorism and so forth and so right. on, is a leveling. Flattening out. A flat, sure. a flattening out. I wonder whether the management structure should have been flattened out right. to deal with the, the digital age and the techni uh, technical parts of the... Yeah. Uh, that's yeah. another good point. Yeah. I mean, uh, some bank is in this in context, this context, you might look, think about Goldman Sachs, which has always had a slightly flatter management structure. The guys who run the divisions all sit on a management committee. It's much more collegial, and everybody has to justify, you know, the risks they're taking, etc. And that seems to have worked a bit better than the sort of top-down management set places like Merrill where everybody basically reported to Stan O'Neill and he, you know, he took the ultimate decisions. I think you're right, you know, if I was running an investment bank, I'd want the guys who are, um, if not making the decisions, the guys who are directly supervising the guys making the decisions to be represented at top level so that everybody has a better idea of what's going on. Now, everyone talks about credit default swaps and as soon as the words come out of my mouth, I can hear the click on the, <laughs> on the T, but TV, but I read uh, one article in which you said you bought a house in, 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 right. Brook, in Brooklyn. And it just seemed to me maybe you'd had a mortgage. And uh, it's the way the swap works in a, in a very simple sense is the bank looks at your credit, right. maybe you had some other loans out there, right. and goes to me, let's say I'm a very rich person, not very often, <laughs> they go to, would go to a corporation and say, why don't you guarantee those? Right. Why don't you guarantee those things? I mean, that's all all we're talking about, and it, what it does, and it see if you, it, 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 people don't think of it this way, but when I agree to take care of your mortgage or your right. credit, I'm, I'm creating, uh, I'm, a, I'm creating debt, really, because, uh, because right. I'm going to, I'm going to be stuck with it at some point. Right, well, you're, you're, you're taking on an insurance contract, basically. Yeah. They call credit default swaps. I don't know why they call them that. It's probably a marketing thing. What they should be called is credit insurance. Yeah. You basically, all these mortgages are securitized into bonds, just like a, a treasury bond or anything else. You then go to a company like AIG and say, look, there's a small chance these, these bonds are going to default, in which case I'm going to be in trouble. Will you insure me? Can I pay you a premium so that in the event that these things default, you make up their full value? It's an insurance contract. 
Now, what's happened is the probabilities of default in those contracts w were thought to be very low, so the premiums were pretty low, but of course, everything's blown up. It turns out a lot of these underlying mortgages, there are 20, 30, 40% default rates. So the guys who wrote the insurance contracts, you know, they're gonna have to pay out and they just didn't have enough capital. AIG actually had more capital than a lot of the others, but a lot of these smaller insurance companies just couldn't afford it and they've already gone to the wall. So, you know, it, it, it was basically a mispricing of insurance. The uh, amount of these uh, CDS, if I call it that, for years of conversation, is thought to be enormous, 40 right. to 60 trillion dollars. Right. And uh, my point of going through that simple thing with you is just to point out that's 40, 60 million dollars of somebody owing something right. to somebody, and in that's a lot of <laughs> damn uh, debt. No, it is. I mean, it's it's 40. I think it's 65 trillion is the. 60, um, what did I say? Billion. Uh, billion. I mean, it's, I it's to easy trillion. to lose. I meant to say trillion. Easy to tr lose track of all the right. zeros here. Right. Everybody does. You know, 65 trillion. The U.S. economy is about 14 trillion now. So if my mathematics is right, that's you know getting up towards five times the size of the U.S. economy, outstanding in in well, credit default swaps. But a lot of those. I don't want to get into too much technical detail. People were insuring with each other. A was insuring with B, who was insuring with D, who was insuring with E. A lot of those were sort of canceling each other out. Yeah. I mean, that was one of the issues at Lehman <coughs> Brothers when they went when they went under. The, the weekend they were going broke, the government and uh, all their counterparties were in there trying to figure out, once you net out all the individual contracts, who actually ends up owing what. Nobody knows, really, but it'll be a lot less than $65 trillion. Yeah, but it's going to be a lot. It's a lot, sure. Well. Uh, does this or does this not take us to the greed uh, part of the uh, equation, or at least the easy credit? How about we'll, we'll do it either way? I mean, there are other ways of explaining easy, well, I, easy I, credit, and maybe you'd want to take another shot, for example, at Mr. Greenspan. I don't well, no, I mean, easy credit, I mean, do, do it do it in reverse order, yeah, easy okay. credit, because the credit default swaps, just seen as we're already talking about that, they contribute to the easy credit it became a lot easier to sell mortgage securities because these credit default swaps existed. Basically, there was an enormous explosion of credit of all types between 2002, 2007, and uh, mortgage securities were the biggest, asset, the biggest central ele single element of that, but there was also all sorts of other types of credit like lending to hedge funds, lending to LBO firms, just lending to consumers, you know, in terms of credit card debt. So well, subprime mortgages. Subprime, example, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Subprime mortgage. But as they say, subprime so mortgages. Tons of credit money going out there. Just easy money uh, available for everybody, and you know that that's an invitation to get greedy, isn't it? Because if you know if, if you can borrow fifty dollars where you could only for every dollar you're putting up, as opposed to ten than you did before, then you're likely to take the fifty and invest it in the market because you think you're going to get higher returns. So you know, greed and credit always interact. I mean, that's the classic, you know, foundations for any speculative era. I think in one of your articles, uh, you go back to, uh, to that 2002, right. as you just did then, uh, in which you, you say that, uh, let's see if I got this right, that, that the Federal Reserve right. knocked the rates down so low right. that uh, it created a credit boom. And the reason the Fed did this was its fear of deflation. Do I right. have you right? Yeah, it's, I mean, Can you explain that to it's me? It's quite complicated. but yeah. the. Um, it's not, it sounds complicated, it's not actually no, that complicated. Do it, you can do it after, simply. <laughs> after 9-11, if you remember, yeah. there were big fears that the U.S. economy was going to go in a deep recession. The Fed cut interest rates very dramatically, did a very good job actually after, um, immediately after 9-11. They actually prevented a big fall off in the economy. There was a very mild recession in the second part of 2001, but if you go back and read the stories at the time, everybody said, you know, this is going to be cataclysm. It wasn't. The economy came back quite well. Now, at that stage, the Fed, in my opinion, and some other people, should have started raising interest rates. But they didn't. They got worried because prices were falling qu quite, they weren't falling, but because inflation was very low, they started thinking that prices might actually start falling, as they had done in Japan in the 1990s, and would be stuck in a deflationary spiral, which can be very damaging to the economy because the real value of debts gets bigger, banks stop lending, and what happened in Japan is you had 10 years of economic stagnation. So instead of raising interest rates as they should have been because the economy was recovering, they kept interest rates. Who's they? Well, Greenspan and his Greenspan. colleagues. And yeah, Greenspan okay. ran the Federal Reserve yeah. as his own fiefdom, really. So yeah. it is Alan Greenspan who's yeah. responsible for this policy. Although Ben Bernanke, who was a member of the board at the time, also supported it. They kept interest rates, I would say, artificially low for um, two years until 2004. Now, what does that mean? It means that money is cheap, credit's cheap. 
the, under, the, the uh, federal funds rate was down at 1%, so you know, borrowing rates are linked to that. You may could borrow money at 2, 3, 4% if, if you were a big investor or a big corporation. It was an invitation for people to go out and gear up and you know, take on more and more credit. And that was the foundation of the credit boom. So there's two sides to it, I always think. Well, it's three sides. You know, there's the greedy guys on Wall Street. Now, there's always going to be greedy guys on Wall Street. That's what Wall Street is. It's a place for greedy guys to make money. Then, you know, there's the media who's supposed to oversee it somewhat. But, they, you know, then there's the financial police, and that's the SEC and the, and, the, and the Fed. It's their job to police the system. And, you know, my argument's always been in this case, they, you know, for what they thought were good reasons, I'm not saying they're venal, what they thought were good reasons, they just didn't police the, police the system effectively. Uh, let's go back to the deflation idea. Yeah. Uh, I don't want you to think that I'm a sole cause person who finds a digital connection in everything that's ever been done, <laughs> but I am. Right. But one thing that was interesting about uh, the digital age, the digital revolution, is that uh, because you had the computer, you could get people to do, uh, the same person to do more work, right. and you created what was known as productivity. Sure. And uh, it seems to me you could argue that at this point, 2002, right. uh, the Fed's worried about deflation, right. no inflation. In fact, there were some books written at the time that there should maybe inflate the economy. Right. It's not so easy to inflate the economy when you have a lot of productivity, productivity because it's driving, right. driving but, the un, uh, away. But, but, and I wonder if that possibly could be another example of not fully understanding what era we're in. I, probably not fair comment because Greenspan was, was pretty good. I mean, there were two aspects. Yeah. Of two aspects why inflation was so low. One, the digital technology-driven productivity growth is which you're, what you're talking about. Right. The price of computers was collapsing. Computers are embodied in almost everything these days, so you know that does give a big deflationary kick to the economy. But that had been going on since the 90s, and as you say, to Alan Greenspan's credit, he was one of the first people to see that. The second big thing that kicked in, though, in about 2002 was the sort of Japan, what I call the Japan and India factor. You know, they'd their growth got to the stage when they were suddenly competing with a lot of American exports. They were sending goods to us at prices which we couldn't compete with. That's another big deflationary force hitting the economy. So Greenspan and his colleagues thought, you know, this is getting dangerous because when, for a bunch of technical reasons, once inflation gets down around zero, or, or one percent and the interest rates get down that low it's very hard for the federal reserve to to re control the economy because they can't reduce interest rates below zero or else they'd be giving money away so they want to keep inflation at a lower bound of about two percent that was the reason they decided to keep interest rates ro low as i say you know it's a legitimate argument i just think they got it wrong and yeah, they, well, they, they exaggerated the but they clearly the got it wrong right oh, yeah. well so actually yeah, i think they clearly got it wrong no. if you read alan greenspan's book he's just put out a new edition with uh, with a new chapter in which he defends himself and says that actually, you know, it, knowing what I know now, I just still made the same decisions at the time. And obviously that's self-serving, but you know, he believes it. Uh, well, I mean, you could say that uh, they misread what was going on. Yeah. Well, because it, deflation was not going on. Well, they were, what Greenspan and his colleagues would say is that, you know, it's the, the, the counterfactual is what if they hadn't done anything, and if they hadn't, then maybe there would have been deflation. They're saying mm -hmm. that their policies got rid of deflation. But even if they were right on that, what they clearly massively underestimated was the sort of side effects of this policy in terms of stoking this enormous housing bubble and the enormous credit boom. And we haven't really talked about the housing bubble. Everybody talks about well, Wall Street. Well, we sort of assumed it. We, yeah. we should really talk about it. I mean, that's, you know, that's what's driving yeah, everything. Yeah, of course. And um, the Fed really... You know, even up to the very end, Greenspan was denying that there even was a housing bubble. Uh, well, it's a pretty interesting tale. I mean, if we accept your view of, of, of history, you got something happens in 2002, credit goes up. But you said that uh, the financial police, or something to this effect, yeah. uh, were absent. Right. Now, what do you mean by that? Well, there's a couple of aspects of it. One, the Fed itself is the ultimate supervisor of the system. And Greenspan, you know, was ultimately the top regulator in the country as head of the Federal Reserve. 
but you know he's a Ayn Rand free market conservative he doesn't really believe in regulation so from the 90s onwards he was celebrating all the um, stripping away of the old New Deal regulations on Wall Street you know Glass-Steagall Act etc he was the main I would say the main intellectual force behind the sort of deregulation movement you know he'd go up to Capitol Hill and say it's a good idea deregulation makes markets more efficient it makes it makes it easier to spread around risks it's all good for the economy so that was that then of course there's the SEC which was falling down on the job as well I mean I don't want to sound like John McCain but the current chairman of the SEC clearly didn't do a very good job you know we there's actually a very good piece in the media recently about how in 2004 in a sort of little reported meeting they allowed the Wall Street investment banks to gear up enormously Cox, you know, just didn't do a very good job as SEC chairman, and you know, it was really a ridiculous appointment. He was a guy who had been against regulation for years and years, just like Greenspan. The Bush administration appointed him to be a weak chairman. Well, you talk about gearing up. By that, you mean that these investment banks, let's suppose they had, well, let's suppose you have a house that's worth a million dollars, right, uh, and you, it's fully paid off, right. Uh, it's a little bit like saying I'm going to borrow thirty million dollars <laughs> against the house. Right. And uh, what are you going to do with the house? Right. I'm going to go buy credit default <laughs> in, in, in insurance. Right. I mean, that's really what happened. Just, How in goodness sake did the uh, investment banks get the ability, or how were they permitted to, with just a million dollars of? Uh, right. of uh, savings let's say to make it simple right go out and buy borrow 30 doesn't anyone get in there and take a look at that well that's uh, that's what i was just talking about there used but to be there used to be regulations on limits on was their, that the on reserve who looked at that or was that that's no? the sec well the, the federal reserve as the ultimate sort of guarantor of stability in the system should have been looking at it but they weren't but the bank the investment banks were regulated by the sec and it was the it was the sec which relaxed the capital regulations as you say Basically, what the investment banks did in the last 10 years is they converted themselves into hedge funds. In the old days, hedge funds. that's what they were, basically. In the old days, they used to, when I say gear up, it means how much investments they have for each dollar of capital. Yeah. In the old days, they used borrowings. to have borrowings, right. exactly. So in, other day, in the old days, say they had a million dollars, they'd borrow 10, 50, maybe 20 at the outer limits and invest that. In the last few years, they've gone up from 20 to 25, 30, 35, 40 in some cases 40. at the peak. You know, $40 Jeez. of borrowings for every dollar. Now, if you think about that, if you've got $100 million of investment and only $2.5 million of capital, then you only need a 2%, 3% swing in the value of investment to wipe out your capital. So these investment banks were incredibly fragile. They were just large hedge funds, even though they call themselves investment banks. Uh, I've been thinking about uh, this for uh, quite a bit, being a uh, New Yorker, as you are, thinking about the real estate prices and thinking about how the economy has been driven right. in New York by the uh, financial community, right. uh, as it always has been, but more so uh, later than uh, now than b before. If you really think what's happened is that uh, with that $1 million house, right. the $30 million has been better and whatever, right. uh, th th they've succeeded. And the success is given these huge, I mean, 30, 40, 50 million do dollars uh, for investment banks, hedge right. funds even more, of money that sits there and then it goes out into New York City into the real estate right. market, but it's all sourced back to this huge oh, you're right. borrowing. And I just, did that have, you know, it's a silly question, I guess, uh, because it's so ancient, but that's, that sort of thing didn't happen as such in the uh, Great Depression. No, it the, did, actually. It did? This sort of was the leverage just, on well, uh, stocks. If you look at, yeah, I mean, it was, they were geared up in a stock market in those days. But if, if you look at New York, I know lots of the Fifth Avenue, the, you know, the fanciest Fifth Avenue buildings were built in the 20s, lots of them. You know, that yeah. is exactly same the same thing. You know, if you look at, go and look at the old history of things like Goldman Sachs' famous Shenandoah Fund, which was, you know, the mutual fund, they had enormous amounts of leverage built into the system, and that's, they crashed in exactly the same way. I mean, there's never anything really new in finance. You know, they, these, <laughs> these cycles always recur in some way or another. The actual vehicles are new, but the underlying principles, as you say, greed and leverage, they're, they're always there. Uh, how did the government stand by and let a 40 to 60 trillion market gross borrowing, I would call it, uh, take place. Is that the same idea as? Micro default swaps, you mean? Uh, yeah. 
I think most people, most people in government just didn't understand it, for one thing. I mean, the guys on Wall Street weren't saying to the government, look, come in and take a look at this. And um, the SEC was not in, you know, was not in the business of um, aggressively looking at new products. You know, so no one, did, did, anyone, did anyone have their eye on this ball at all? It just went right past them? Yeah, I think so. I think so. Although, so I, you know, credit default swaps, to me, it's an aspect of the overall story. But I don't think it's you know I don't think it's the big story. Well, it was a big story. Uh, I'll take your view on that. But uh, it seems to have been a reasonably big story for uh, Bear Stearns and AIG. What oh, no, do you think about that? Sorry, it's it's a big story. I mean, yeah. I don't think it's the big story. I mean, the, the big story is the gearing up on the top of the housing yeah. market, yeah. and you know, in terms of, of subprime, etc. Credit default swaps were an aspect well, of ask, that. Well, let me ask. Let me stop. You said the uh, okay. So you're saying the great. You, you start off with the credit. Right. You try to see where it is. I've talked about investment banks, but you say, yeah, I really should have been on the people borrowing money against their houses because that's where the great greatest credit well, that, was. Well, and that's where, the, and that's where the crash comes from, too. Because but would you have had the crash if you didn't have the credit default swaps? Sure, sure. You would have? Yeah. Uh, and the credit default swap just, just made it The credit worse. default swap just made it a bit easier to market the, yeah. uh, the market, the mortgage securities. They gave the investment banks the false assurance that, you know, for example, Merrill Lynch again, because I wrote about them, I know I know what they did quite well. They had a bunch of these mortgage securities on their balance sheet, i.e. they owned them. They were called credit credit default obligations, but we won't don't need to get into jargon. They're basically just mortgage securities. They're sitting on their balance sheet, they own them. So in order to reassure the guys at the top of the firm that, you know, they're not going to blow up. They hedge them, and the way they hedge them is by buying credit default swaps. But it's part of the spiral. Then. It's part of the spiral. Yeah. It's not, it's not Let me the ask you: uh, uh, if we were to have a bailout plan that uh, bought those securities you're talking about in the amount of what are we talking? Six hundred billion. Seven hundred. Seven hundred billion. billion. Uh, will it do any good? Well, who knows? Is the short answer. I think it might do a bit of good. I mean. I myself am a, I'm more sort of supportive of the idea of injecting capital directly into the banks through buying preference shares or taking over the struggling ones, which is what happened eventually in Japan and what happened in Scandinavia in the early 90s. But you know, this is actually an interesting experiment, the government going out and buying these securities because they haven't been trading for the last year and a half, so yeah. nobody really knows what they're worth. Ben Bernanke and Paulson say, you know, well, maybe we can find out what they're worth. That'll at least be a step ahead. People can mark them properly. So I'm not against the idea. I don't think it'll solve the entire problem. We've come to an end. I have to ask you whether the crisis is in some part a digital phenomenon, or is it just the same old story again of easy credit and greed? Um, I think they're the two, you know, most important factors. But certainly, I think the digital, the whole sort of digital world in which we live made it a bigger a bigger boom and bust cycle than it would otherwise would have been. Thank John you. Cassidy, thanks a lot for coming thank by. You. And thank you for coming by and come by next week and learn more about the digital age. For the digital age I am James Goodale. Good night and have a good week.